Good day, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in philosophy. This is part of my lectures in modern philosophy. And for this lecture, I will focus on the philosophy of George Hegel. Now, let's go to the development of consciousness. So again, in this development of consciousness, we will see how the dialectical principle, the dialectical process, is fully integrated. In his Phenomenology of the Spirit, Mind or Hegel shows how the electrical reasoning examine its movements, its own movements, through an examination of what appears in experience in order to understand its necessary structures. So by experience, he meant our various ways of being in the world and relating to the world. Now, while Kant discovered a single set of categories, remember our discussion on Kantian philosophy about the formal a priori categories of the mind that were the same for all rational minds, Hegel found a variety of possible forms of experience, like the sensuous and the intellectual, the emotional and reflective, the practical and the theoretical, the religious and secular, etc. So Hegel examined each of them until their inadequacies are exposed and a richer and more adequate approach emerges from their failures. So again, the dialectical process at work. This process of examination follows three stages. Sense certainty, which is based on our experience of a particular object, the first stage. This is the initial attempt to understand the nature of things through our sense perception. However, this often runs counter to the requirement that concepts must be universal. So if you remember Kant, for Kant, for knowledge to be valid, it must be universal. Knowledge must be universal. So it cannot be based simply on sense perception because it's a requirement of knowledge for concepts to be universal. Okay? Meaning, universal concept, individual we may have uh, their own perceptions or sense perception, but they must have the same concept, the universal concept. Now, this leads to the second stage, which is the perception. Here, the consciousness views and interprets the object as having universal properties. So, first, there is sense. We can call it sense perception or the our, our vision, for example, our uh, and direct contact with reality, with the object. But in perception, now we focus on the universal properties. So the mind appeals different categories of thought among individuals through communication and at the common, the level of common language. So the concepts we have are already thought about these concepts, no? meaning our concepts have been shaped by people who have already thought about it. Discourses of people who have already thought about these concepts. So they will shape our perceptions. So we have our own sense and then specific objects, but then we read, we consult the discourses, the writings of other people and their thoughts about these concepts will also shape our own perceptions of these concepts. In the third stage is understanding. Consciousness conceives of the object in terms of laws that account for the unity of the object. And of course, there will always be a difference between the data of our senses and the concepts about the world. And therefore, because of this, we feel 
a kind of uncertainty or skepticism. Because there will always be a difference between what we see in reality from our senses, data of our senses, and the concepts about these objects, there will always be a difference. And therefore, it brings about a kind of skepticism of, or uncertainty. But while the mind can understand or grasp certain concepts, it is also aware of the inadequacy of these concepts. And therefore, the mind moves to find new ground for certainty, generating new concepts that it, you know, that it can account for the differences. Of course, this there is always a constant failing in, you know, in coming up with the certainty. Because the concepts will also reveal their own inner contradiction. The mind then posits more adequate concepts. And although certainty may seem elusive, we cannot fully be absolutely certain about our knowledge of things, but the process of moving from less satisfactory to more satisfactory concepts, from sense certainty to concepts, and then concepts having their own uh, inner contradiction and then positing more adequate concepts, etc., etc. This actually entails a learning process, a kind of understanding. And for Hegel, understanding is the highest form of consciousness. But we attain that highest form of consciousness, of understanding, after going through the dialectical process. So according to Hegel, the knowledge of physical things presupposes the view that the physical world consists of force interacting according to laws. The knowledge of such a world is also a type of self-knowledge. Since when we try to understand the forces behind phenomena, we become aware of what we ourselves have devised and put there. So the physical world of scientific theory presupposes self-conscious beings. And the examination of self-consciousness presupposes a plurality of living and desiring beings, each of whom seeks to subdue the world to his own wishes, to make it part of himself. From this stage of the consciousness, the dialectical carries on to the next level, and that level is the level of self-consciousness. So the, the consciousness or the mind is now conscious of itself. So the consciousness of objects also implies an awareness or consciousness of the self as a subject, which is separate from the perceived object. So in this case, the subject can also be the object of some other subjects. So you see the subject, it has its own object. By being conscious of the object, it becomes conscious of itself. And this subject that is conscious of itself can also be the object of other subjects. So other subjects can also be conscious of this subject. Okay, so that's the process, the, the development of our conscious. So while the subject is aware of itself, it is also aware of that other subjects can also be aware of the subject. So while I'm, I, I am aware of object, by becoming aware of the object, of a particular object, of a particular book in front of me, I am, I am also aware of myself that I am capable of reading, understanding this book. So I become aware of myself. But I also become aware of other subjects who may also be aware of myself. So therefore, I also become an object for other subjects. Okay, so therefore we can be aware of ourselves by being ourselves through the eyes of another or other subjects. Here, there is a struggle for both power and recognition because we want, the self wants to assert 
itself. Okay? It wants to be recognized as itself, but there are also others who may also be exerting effort on the self. So this struggle is between two opposing inclinations arising in self-consciousness. There is the moment when the self and the other come together, which makes self-consciousness possible. And on the other hand, the moment of recognizing the difference between oneself and the other. That there is a difference between the self and the other, or the other selves. The realization of self-consciousness is a struggle for power and recognition between two individuals bound to one another as an equal. Sometimes the other may be higher than the self. In this struggle, some will take greater risks than their competitors, meaning those who risk the least will become the slaves or bondsmen of those who face death by risking their lives. So there will be people who will take the greater risk and there will be people who will take the lesser risk of being recognized, you know, of expressing its own power to be recognized. So if you take less risk to be recognized, then according to Hegel, we become slaves. But if you take the greater risk of being recognized, then we are able to preserve our lives. So those who face or risk their lives, they're able to preserve their lives to assert themselves to be recognized. But the others who does not take risk, they become slaves and they submit to the masters who would regard the slaves as nothing but a means to his own designs, meaning to his own interests. So the slave then is forced to work while the master can easily enjoy leisure in the knowledge that the slave is reshaping the natural world to provide the products of his labor for the master to consume. So, the next dialectical transition is from mind that is attempting to master nature to mind that seeks freedom and independence in itself. The mind realizes that he is thinking and therefore free because he remains with himself alone and not in another. This attitude exemplified in Stoicism, but Stoicism passes over into skepticism, and for the Stoic, it finds freedom in himself as rational, thinking being, whereas the skeptic, he pushes freedom until further, uses thought to dissipate its own categories. Now, let's go to metaphysics. His discussion of mind or reason or thought as self-conscious. Hegel's metaphysics follows from his conviction that the real is rational. If reality has a rational structure, then the logic of the dialectics applies not only to concepts, but to reality itself. This implies that in some sense, the world itself contains conflicts or oppositions, out of which new forms of existence shape themselves. So again, the, the dialectical process or the dialectical development. Hegel pictures the world as permeated by a dynamic spiritual force that is in the process of unfolding and bringing into provision a rational purpose. This animating principle is the absolute idea, or simply the absolute, or idea. You know? Sometimes he refers to this as the spirit in a more religious sense, or when talking about history, he refers to this as the world spirit. So, the animating principle is simply the absolute idea or the absolute spirit. Okay? 
So, idea, absolute idea, uh, pretty much the same. By absolute, Hegel meant that which is completely self-contained in the sense that it does not need anything else in order to exist or be conceived. So, it's similar to the notion of the substance, only that Hegel calls it the absolute. Because there, there, there's a difference between substance as the uh, in tradition in perennial philosophy is understood and the absolute as Hegel understands, understands it. The only thing that satisfies this definition is reality as a whole. So reality as a whole is absolute. It's the absolute idea or the absolute spirit. However, the absolute is not only the ultimate substance. It is a living subject. So it's a different conception from the substance in the other philosophers. Therefore, life, mentality, subjectivity, spirit or consciousness is intrinsic in the nature of reality as a whole. Hegel's absolute idealism claims that mind or spirit is inherent in the objects of the world. This means that mind and nature are part of one reality. Very much quite related to the idea that of Schelling that mind or the spirit is latent in nature. But here Hegel develops it more fully. Okay. So, Hegel argued that we will never have knowledge unless concepts are out there as primary constituents of reality in itself. The concepts are the genuine first, and things are what they are through the action of the concepts, immanent in them, revealing itself in them. So it's through the concepts that reality is revealed to us. So idea or concept is similar to the notion or the, the idea or concept is similar to the notion of nature or essence in Aristotle. While nature provides the blueprint of an object's self-actualization, the idea or concept provides the rational and purposeful nature of the world. And therefore, objects in the world are through the action of the idea or concepts. The idea is the overall rational scheme of reality. Hence, when he said that the idea is what is real, he means that all that exists is directed by the idea's structure. Hence, the totality or the absolute is an organic totality in which each individual, including the animate, the plants, the animals, human, communities, states, religion, etc., have their life in the absolute idea. So the mind reflects itself in the world in different modalities. In plants, it is unconscious, as if the mind is asleep. Then in human, it is awakened in this human consciousness. And therefore, with humanity, a part of nature has emerged as self-conscious, able to reflect, understand, choose, decide, become progressively more rational with its new age of science and philosophy. So Hegel claimed that the mind and matter are simply two poles of one and the same continuum, with reality starting to favor the material and later realize itself moving towards the spiritual or the mental. Our minds or individual spirits are parts of the absolute spirit, and our mental life is permeated by the absolute spirit. Now, let's go to the notion of the state. The state, according to Hegel, is the mind objectified. 
the individual mind because of its passions, prejudices, and blind impulses is only partly free because of, of course, of the emotions, of the impulses. The individual mind subjects itself to the burden of necessity, which is the opposite of freedom. This it does in order to obtain or attain a fuller realization of itself in the freedom of the citizen. Meaning for Hegel, individually we are not really free because we are burdened with our passions and prejudices and we attain a fuller realization of ourselves when we uh, when we uh, follow the rules of the state or of the society. So this burden of necessity is first met in the recognition of the rights of others. Next, in morality and fi finally in social morality. The primal institution of the society is the family. And the aggregates of families form the civil society. However, the civil society is an imperfect form of, organ of organization compared with the state. So the state is the perfect social embodiment of the idea and stands in this stage of development for God himself. In the study of state, we consider the constitutional law and when we study its relation to other states, we consider the international law. The study of history in general, we go through the historical vicissitudes of the state as it passes through what Hegel calls the dialectics of history. Meaning, again, the state goes through the dialectical, the dialectical process. So, according to Hegel, the constitution is the collective spirit of the nation and that the government is the embodiment of that spirit. So every nation has its own spiritual, individual spirit. Every nation goes through the stages of its dialectical development. And such spirit can be stifled by a tyrant or a conqueror or a dictator, which Hegel considers to be the greatest of crimes. Now, war is an indispensable means of political progress may be considered as a crisis in the development of the idea embodied in the different states, but for Hegel, out of these crises, a better state will certainly emerge victorious. Now, the dialectics of history. The ground of historical development is rational because the state, as we have mentioned it, is the embodiment of reason as a spirit. It follows that all the apparently contingent events of history are in reality stages in the logical unfolding of the sovereign reason which is embodied in the state. So the passions, impulses, interests, character, personality of individuals are either the expression of reason or the instruments which reason molds for its own use. So, we must therefore understand that historical happenings are the workings of reason towards the full realization of itself in perfect freedom. Consequently, we must interpret history in purely rational terms and throw the succession of events into logical categories. According to Hegel, the general view of history reveals three most important stages of development. First, is the Oriental monarchy, meaning the stage of whatness, of suppression of freedom. The second is Greek democracy, and that is the stage of expansion in which freedom was lost in unstable demagogy. And third is Christian constitutional monarchy, which represents the reintegration of freedom in constitutional government. So this is uh, how Hegel viewed world history and obviously he favors the uh, he favors the Western uh, Western uh, uh, expression no? uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Western expression or the Western manifestation 
or the Western historical events because he considered it as the, the highest in the development of history. So we can see here the, uh, uh, the maybe the bias of, of Hegel towards uh, European, uh, European, uh, uh, European society. Now, let's go to the absolute mind. In the state, the individual uh, mind is limited by subjugation to other minds. In the final step in the process of the acquisition of freedom, the absolute mind expressed in art, in religion, in philosophy, subject itself to itself alone. So this is now the absolute mind, you know, the expression of the absolute mind, where it is not subjugated to other minds but to itself alone. In art, mind intuitively contemplates about itself as realized in the art material. And in the development of the art, the art materials lend its, themselves to the actualization of mind or the idea. In religion, mind feels the, feels the superiority of itself to the particularizing limitations of finite things. Like in the philosophy of history, there are three great moments. Oriental religion, which saturated the idea of the infinite. The Greek religion, which gave undue importance to the finite. And Christianity, which represents the union of the finite and the infinite. Last of all, the absolute mind. As philosophy transcends the limitations imposed on it, even in religious feeling, by discarding representatives, representative, representative intuition, it attains all truth under the form of reason. So whatever truth there is in art and in religion is contained in philosophy, but in a higher form, in a much fuller form, and free from all limitations. So philosophy, therefore, for Hegel, is the highest, the freest, in the wisest phase of the union of subjective and objective mind and the ultimate goal of all development. Now, let's go to his critique of modern philosophy's epistemology. Because, of course, he comes after the great tradition of rationalism and empiricism which were uh, synthesized combined by Immanuel Kant. But Hegel has something to say about this kind of epistemology. Hegel, Hegel's epistemology starts with again with the slogan, the rational is real, and that all reality conform to a rational pattern. The history of philosophy he observed is full of conflicting accounts of reality, some bordering towards skepticism, but our ideas develop through, again, the process of the dialectic. And Hegel made a critique of modern philosophy's epistemology based on the epistemologies of the rationalists and the empiricists, and then, of course, put together by Immanuel Kant. The previous philosophers started their philosophies by trying to discover the correct criterion of knowledge, meaning the ultimate basis of knowledge, in order to justify belief. And this resulted to a vicious cycle because any search for a criterion of knowledge, according to Hegel, will always have to start at some knowledge and its starting point will always be arbitrary and will need some justifications. So, the rationalists will say, well, knowledge should be based on reason, and they will provide some justification. And the empiricists will say, well, it should be based on experience, and they will also provide their own justification. So, in philosophy, we can do nothing but begin where we begin, according to Hegel. So, we can begin in the sense, or we can begin in reason. It will not matter for Hegel. In the process, we will find that consciousness provides its own criterion from within itself so that the investigation becomes a comparison of consciousness within itself because reason and perception 
or experience are all parts of consciousness itself. So we can start with any proposed approach to knowledge, accept its own terms, and try to see if it fulfills its own promise. Any inadequate conception of knowledge will eventually fail based on its own standards. But in the midst of this failure, again following the dialectical principle, a new and more adequate approach can be found. Thus, the adequate criterion for knowledge arises through a conscious, continuously self-correcting process. Epistemologists from Descartes to Kant made a sharp contrast between contents of the mind and the thing itself. Such approach eventually become or became the, a task of determining whether there is a correspondence between the two realms or not, which eventually lead to skepticism. So to overcome this dualism and distinguishing our beliefs and reality, Hegel examines the process of how we modify our beliefs. The distinction between beliefs and their objects arises solely in the mind as we continually move from simplistic and inadequate conceptions to more comprehensive uh, and more coherent ones. So this movement from conceptions to conceptions takes place solely within consciousness or within the mind itself. It does not happen as if we jump out of our minds to compare our ideas, our concepts with the facts outside of our minds or facts that are in the external world. So we don't jump out of our minds. So the, the, the confrontation, the, the, this movement, this this logical manipulation, as we have used the expression a while ago, happens in the mind itself. So, the dichotomy between object and idea is continually being overcome within the developing stages of our own consciousness or within our own understanding. So, for Hegel, there's no need to to choose between the rationalist and the empiricist because the ongoing process, the ongoing logical you know, manipulation of concepts happens in consciousness in consciousness itself. Now let's go to the last portion, the influence of Hegelian philosophy. In Hegel's philosophical system, from the concept being developed the concept of becoming, uh, from the concept being, develop the concept of becoming, and the various phases of becoming in which the absolute ideas passes itself during the course of human history. Its phase of history is the expression of the gradual articulation or organization of the concepts, leading to the realization of their inadequacies and contradictions, and then you know, its scheme is replaced or its concept is replaced by another higher or more adequate one until finally we will arrive at absolute knowledge or the absolute spirit will emerge. Okay. So the whole historical process is comprehended as a single logical unfolding or logical development through the dialectics. And in Hegelian view, both the moral and religious development are simply phases in this grand process, in this total process of development. Now, one of the most fundamental claims of Hegel is that history is moving towards, moving forward towards the fulfillment of a rational idea, the absolute spirit. Now, while there are those who subscribe to this claim, there are also those who are either skeptical or do not have faith that reason or thought and reality are converging towards a single, all-encompassing system, the absolute spirit or the absolute idea, 
that will harmonize all the tensions and conflicts within human thought and life. And to this skepticism, Hegel could simply reply that the rationality of the universe or the rationality of the whole of reality is presupposed by all that we do. There is a rational, there is a rationality in the scheme of things, and there is also a rational structure in our thoughts. Now, many thinkers in the 9th century embraced this idea because it provided a coherent view of piecing together, putting up together every aspect of human experience and life. It had an impact on how we study history and how we view historical development. It also offered some kind of corrective to the individualism that pervades during the time and pervades even until now, that view society as, as, simple, as simply a collection of separate and individual, you know, distinct individuals. Society and history, according to Hegel, are not just the sum of all their parts. There is such a spirit of the time that prevails or underlies its stage of development. However, there are those in the history, in the 20th century, who are critical of this grand rational system. And one of such critics is Soren Kierkegaard, who argues that Hegel dissolved the concreteness of individual existence into abstractions which are characteristics of the real characteristics of the realm of concepts. According to Kierkegaard, any particular conceptual scheme represents not an actuality but a possibility. Further, according to Kierkegaard, whether a given individual realizes this possibility and so endows it with existence depends upon the individual and not upon the concepts. And for Kierkegaard, there is such a thing as free will, an individual free will, which cannot be subsumed into the grand scheme of things. So what the individual does depends not upon what he understands or does not depend on the grand scheme of things, but upon what he wills, upon his own subjectivity. So Kierkegaard will usher a new movement in philosophy, departing from the idealism or rationalism of the modern age, which reached its highest point in Hegel's philosophy. He will usher in a new movement in existentialism. And phenomenology, which would, be, which would be one of the schools in contemporary philosophy. So, thank you very much for listening.